from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, the 102nd Psalm, and beginning with verse 5, well, say just 6. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Today, I went for a few minutes out into the foothills and took a little walk down a little road. I didn't want to go too far because they told me there were rattlesnakes around there. I'm not a friend of rattlesnakes for some reason. No, they're not my friend. We have a lot of them where I live, so we have experience with them. I let my wife kill those. And she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I ever heard of. But she's certainly not afraid of snakes. She was born and reared in China uh, in a town that she said she never went to sleep a single night that she didn't hear gunshots. And so she learned not to be afraid because she's never saw fear in her father and mother because the town would change hands every once in a while as bandits or warlords would come in and then finally the Japanese came and my father-in-law had a big hospital and he lived through all that and she was there 17 years. But I want to say that today as I walked out on that little place, I began to think and meditate a little bit and I watched a bird I don't know the name of that bird. It's a big bird and it has different colors. It may be a magpie, I'm not sure, but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears. And then the bird sat on a fence post and he sat there by himself. No mate came around. Now we have a lot of doves where I live and as you know, they mate for life and they would go around together and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. <laughs> and, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone. And I thought about this passage of scripture that's found in the 101st of 102nd Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight, there are many lonely people here, many single people in the city of Denver. 51% of your population is single. And many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure but thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had a neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said, which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot. 
lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. And it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me. And we all have the disease, and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see, in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respect of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper. And it tells about the betrayal of Judas. And the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God. But you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away. You've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ. You felt you knew him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence, trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, creates a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him at times, he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna, that same week, 
five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell, all the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment, a lonely period when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me. I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness, he offers you a new life, he offers you peace and joy and friendship, never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God. Because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture. And the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face. And fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you. He rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. 
Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures, parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social world at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him bear your burdens. Help you solve your problems. Help direct and lead you in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Or help you in your marriage? Who you ought to marry? There's a lady talked to me tonight who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or 10 years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, they're boys somewhere, and let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. <laughs> but we prayed, and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons. Both, for the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it all only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, Oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again, for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out, reach out to the cross, and you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work, and after dinner I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial. The station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you call those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their Savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3:16, and the people here 
set it all together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And last night, more than 1,700 people came and made their commitment to Christ. A few weeks ago, no, no. A few weeks ago in one of our crusades, a man looked at that same verse and the counselor told him, you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, put your name there, whosoever believeth or commit his life to him will never perish but have everlasting life. And then he had a grin on his face and he said, I like that. You can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night. God so loved the world for you that he gave his son. And you put your name and say, Lord, I open my heart and my life to you. I commit myself to you. For some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we saw those people do last night. and We've seen people in every continent of the world do. And more than three score countries, we've seen people do what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I want to serve Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to receive Christ. I want to come to the cross. I want to put my confidence and my trust in Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ lives in my heart. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because Jesus, every person Jesus called, He called publicly. And He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and taking a stand in public that makes it count. I'm going to ask you, if you come from that gallery up on top, it's going to take you two or three minutes, so start now. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium, please. This is the holy moment. And God is speaking to you wherever you are. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'll say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Or you can bring your friend with you, but just get up and come quickly, hundreds of you. Back over here, over there, upstairs. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you even though you're in the choir. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a leader in your church, but God has spoken to you about your need of Christ. You get up and come. Over here on the ends, everywhere, quickly. As you can see, many hundreds are responding to the invitation of Mr. Graham to make Jesus Christ Lord of their life. You too can make that same decision. There's a phone number on your screen right now. This is your number for spiritual help and counseling. Write the number down. If the lines are busy, just wait a few moments and call again. Special friends are standing by to talk with you and pray with you. Make that call now. you in other parts of the country that have been watching by television, you can make this same commitment tonight. And whether you're in at home or in a bar or in a hotel room, you can have that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, that you're justified. And the word justified means just as though you had never sinned in your life. That's how God looks at you through the blood of Christ. He will come into your heart where you are. And if you'll make that commitment, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. May God help you to make that commitment that so many hundreds here in Colorado are making on this beautiful Colorado evening. God bless you.
And this reminder again, as Mr. Graham has just told you, we'd like to talk with you and pray with you, so make that telephone call now. The number is there on your screen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me to the 20th chapter of the book of John. The 20th chapter of the book of John, beginning with the 24th verse. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, you've believed. But blessed are they, blessed are they in 1977, blessed are they, that have not seen. They've not been able to touch my body. They've not been able to see the nail prints in my hand. They have not been able to see the place where I was pierced by the spear. But they believe anyway. There's a special blessing and a special reward for them because they have to come by sheer faith. You have seen and felt and touched as well as believed. That has a message for us, but I don't want to go into that whole dialogue because time is very short and I don't want to be very long tonight. I want to take one little phrase out of that and use it tonight, the hands of Jesus. The 20th chapter and the 27th verse, behold my hands, behold my hands. Do you know how many times the word hands are used in the Bible, or the word hand is used in the Bible? 1,433 times. Now look at your hands. Take them out in front of you and look at them a moment. It's the most versatile part of all your body. We climb with our hands. We push with our hands. We pull with our hands. We throw with our hands. We catch with our hands. We can tear with our hands. We can thread with our hands. We can sew with our hands. We can chisel with our hands. We can saw with our hands. We can drive a nail with our hands. We can draw a picture on a canvas with our hands. We can play an instrument with our hands as we heard these men from Ireland a moment ago. We can even walk on our hands, as I've seen some do. And of all the five senses, the eagle can see better, the dog can smell better, and the horses can sense better and hear better with their ears. But none of the animals have the hands that are capable of such diversification as the human hands. Think of everyday usage that we make of hands. If you want assistance, you say, lend me a hand. If you want experience, you say, I'm an old hand at that. If you want to express a wasted life, you say, well, he's empty-handed. If you want somebody who's greatly involved, you say, well, he's got his hands full, he can't do it. 
and the wedding ceremony. At least most of the ceremonies I've gone to, and certainly all that I've conducted, some point in the ceremony, I asked them to join their right hands. And then when the church offices are ordained in many denominations, what do we do? We place our hands on them, as they did in the scriptures. Julie Eisenhower wrote a wonderful little book, not a little book, it's a big book, on interesting people. It's one of the most interesting books I've ever read. And one of the interesting people she wrote about was my wife. And they serialized uh, that chapter in a number of newspapers across the country. Maybe they did here, I don't know. But she has the most remarkable description of my wife's hands that I've ever read. And I thought, well, she's captured not only Ruth's life and her spiritual dimension. And you know, Julie was in our home for several days and she never took a note. She must have a tremendous memory because everything in that chapter is almost to perfection about my wife. A little bit about me. She, she got that straight too. But in reading the four gospels, they constitute a picture book of Jesus' hands. And I want you to see the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. First, the creating hands. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul in Colossians said, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created, visible and invisible. All the mountains, all the seas, all the stars, all the planets, all the galaxies were made by Him. Those hands flung those galaxies into space from flaming fingertips. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus says, in this chapter, behold my hands. He also said it in Luke 24, behold my hands. The hands that created the world. The Lord Jesus Christ's hands. And then secondly, there's the healing hands. We've been talking about people in the city of Cincinnati in this area tonight hurting. People that are in the hospitals that are sick. People that are dying right this minute. People that have been told today that they have terminal cancer. People today. The dean of our college where we live, one of the most wonderful men I've ever known, fell out of a tree today. He's dead tonight. We don't know whether he had a heart attack or what happened yet, or whether he, he broke his back or his neck when he fell. One of our neighbors and one of our friends. Our hands, the healing hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he uses your hands as you minister, the hands of a doctor, the hands of a nurse, the hands of a social worker, the hands of the clergyman, the hands of the psychiatrist or the psychologist to talk to you, to heal you, to help you. But there's the hands of Jesus to heal your heart, to heal your mind, to heal your soul, to heal your body, if he wills. Think of the leper crying, unclean, unclean, unclean. The lepers, no one could go near them, social outcast. Little bells they would ring in those days. Keep away, keep away, I'm a leper. Unclean, unclean. Jesus walked right up to them and put his hand right on the leper. Can you imagine what that meant to that leper? I imagine years had gone by since a human hand had touched him and Jesus touched him. And he was healed. The leprosy was gone. The healing touch of the hand of Jesus. Remember when he went to Peter's home. Peter's mother-in-law was sick nigh unto death. Jesus went in and took her by the hand. She got up and began to wait on the tables. The healing touch of Jesus, the man born blind. Jesus calls him 
to get a little dust from the earth, collects the saliva and puts it in the dust and makes a little salve and puts it on his eyes with his hands. And he's healed. The touch of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in healing. Has he come into your heart to heal your hurt? The hurt between you and your wife? The hurt between you and your son? The hurt between you and your brother? The hurt between you and your neighbor? The hurt of poverty out of a job? The hurt of bad health? Whatever it is, let Jesus touch you tonight. He loves you. He wants to help. But he can't help if you keep the door closed. You have to open the door. You see, he's standing there knocking with his hand, as we'll see in a moment. And then thirdly, we've been talking about earlier this evening, the hand of compassion. He said, I have compassion on the multitude because they've now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. So he said, feed them, the hungry people of the world. He has compassion on them. He has compassion on you tonight, in your need, in your hurt, in your place, in your suffering. And as he looked out over the city of Jerusalem, he had compassion on that great and magnificent city. He knew that judgment was in store for the city, and it says that he had compassion on them. And he looks over Cincinnati tonight. He looks over Kentucky and Indiana and Ohio, these three great states, and he has compassion. And then fourthly, there's the hand of blessing. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took up the little children, and the scripture says, he blessed them. I see little children here tonight. You may have gray hair and you may have a bald head, but in God's sight you're a little child. And Jesus wants to take you in his arms and love you and bless you and change you and make you a new person and make your home a new place and give you hope and purpose and meaning for life if you'll let him, but you have to open the door. But you have to become as a little child. You can't come to Jesus with your shoulders red back and with a lot of pride. You have to get rid of all that pride and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. You died for me on the cross, and I'm coming to that cross, and I want your blessing. I want forgiveness of my sins. Has that happened to you? And then fourthly, there's the suffering hands of Jesus. And this is the thing we will be most impressed with when we see him in heaven. Because you see, when we get to heaven, we're going to find that his hands suffered when they drove those nails in. And then when they picked him up and hung him between heaven and earth and the terrible jolt that tore his hands. And the wound was so great that Thomas could put his own hands in those holes. And Jesus will wear those scars for eternity. And when I look at the cross, I see at least three things. I see sin. The most sinful place in the history of the world is the cross. Jesus became the most sinful man that ever lived. You know why? The scripture says he became sin for us. He had never known sin. All of a sudden, he not only had the sins of the people of that generation, but he had the sins of all mankind. Every person that will ever live, he had the sins on him. He became guilty of every single sin. Think of a person that had never sinned, and all of a sudden, every sin he's guilty of. His suffering was 10,000 times worse than that of the average man who would be crucified. He was suffering spiritually when he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
the suffering hands of Jesus, I see sin. But I also see something else on the cross. I see the love of God. I, I, can't, ex I can't describe it. There's no way to describe God's love. It's too deep, it's too high, it's too broad. It's too great. The New Testament writers had to invent a new word to describe the love of God. There was no word for love in the whole Greek language that could describe the supernatural love of God, so they invented agape. And if he bore our sins on the cross, then God can still be just and still be the justifier. Because if God had just come along and forgiven you without somebody paying the price, he would have been a liar and his moral universe would have blown up and exploded like an atomic bomb. Somebody had to pay the price. Either you or some sinless person that would be acceptable to God and that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing I see in the suffering hands is that it's the only way of salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other except through the name of Jesus. You can't be saved by your works. You can't buy your way. It's not for sale. But Christ offers it to you from the cross. It was the blood that was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, the scripture says. And he shed his blood on that cross for you and it's the only way the blood has to be there remember the night in Egypt in the Old Testament when the death angel passed over and those Jewish people had to have the blood sprinkled on the doorpost in order to be saved the blood had to be there and so the blood has to be there for God to see and he sees the blood of Christ that was shed for you and he passes over when judgment comes. And then there's another thing about the hands of Jesus. What kind of hands? The healing hands, the suffering hands, the nail-scarred hands, but then his knocking hand. In Revelation 3.20, the scripture says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Knocking at the door of the church knocking at the door of your family, knocking at your door. Why doesn't he just push the door open and come in and save me? He never interferes with your will. You have a will of your own. That's the way he made you. He made you in his image. You can reject him. You can go to your grave rejecting Christ and there's nothing God can do about it. He'll do everything in his power to warn you He'll do everything in his power to bring incidents across your path to stop you. But he won't trespass on your will. That's something you have to decide. You have to say, I will receive him as my Savior and my Lord. And so your will is involved. You have to invite him. If you don't invite him in, he won't come in. He'll not push the door open. What motivates a person to open the door? Well, I was talking to a person just before I came to Cincinnati about Jesus Christ. We met on the plane. He told me that he'd been converted a few months earlier. And I said, how were you converted? Well, he said, we had a, a child, our only child. She was killed in an automobile wreck. And he said, I knew that I'd been resisting God for a long time. And he said, as I stood there and watched that little casket go down into the grave, I said, Lord Jesus, come in. And you know, I began to realize that God had to take my little child to get me into the kingdom of heaven. And he said, I often wondered at the love of God. He said, even in my tears, I knew. What motivates you? A railroad engineer fell out of the train and it went across his leg and he lost his leg. And he said, I was there cut in the darkness 
Nobody knew I'd fallen. I lay there, bleeding. And I felt Jesus knocking at my heart's door. And he said, I let him in. He's knocking at your heart's door. Can you hear him? And as you get older, you can barely hear it because your heart gets harder and harder and harder. He that hardens his heart, being often reproved, that means being often with knocking on your door, and you don't do anything about it. God will still speak, but you can't, you can't hear anymore. And the Bible teaches that there's a place beyond which you cross over a line. I'm not quite sure where it is and when it is, but it's there. And that's the reason he says, harden not your heart. Listen to the knock. And then sixthly, there's the outstretched hands of the Lord Jesus, stretching his hands for you and saying, Jim, Bill, Susie, Mary, I love you. I died for you. Come, let me put my arm around you. Let me be your brother. Let me be your husband, your wife. Let me be all that you need in your soul, in your heart, in your mind. Because you see, it's not just to save you from sin and save you for eternity, but it's to save you right now, to walk with you. He'll free you tonight if you let him, those outstretched hands. Like the master violinist, he will touch you and bring beautiful music out of your life because he's the master and he's knocking on your heart's door tonight with those wonderful hands of his that created the universe. Will you open the door and let him in? You have to open. You may be a member of the church. You may be Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, or you may not have any church affiliation. You may not have any religion. I don't know. Or you may be a deacon in the church. You may be singing in the choir. But you know Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. You want to make sure of your relationship to him tonight. You come. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and come and stand here in front and say by coming, I want Christ into my heart. I want to open the door and let him in. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to all of you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. If you come from that top balcony, it takes nearly two minutes. So start right now, quickly. Many of you, hundreds of you, you come and let Christ come into your heart and make you a new person right now. Many people are already on the way. You get up and come with them. Invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ. You can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can already see that hundreds of people are coming here in this beautiful Coliseum in Cincinnati. They're coming to receive Christ. They're opening their heart's door to let him in. You can do the same wherever you are. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. Open the door and let him in. Let his hand touch you. He'll forgive you and change you and make you a new person. God help you to make that decision and be sure and go to church on the Lord's Day. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you.
If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.